Well, welcome back. We're talking about U.S.-Egypt ties as the Egyptian president visits the White House. Still with me, Tofik Hamid. He is the author of Inside Jihad. Omar Oshur is a senior lecturer at the University of Exeter. Claire Lopez is with the Center for Security Policy. And Perry Kamak is with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Let's get back to the discussion. And Tofik, we were talking about this balancing act that the United yeah. States has to go through dealing with a government that has been accused of human rights atrocities, yeah. uh, but a government that it needs strategically. Um, the Washington Post had a commentary piece earlier this week, or last week rather, in which it said that El Sisi's brutal repression, I'm quoting here, has made Egypt a mass production facility for violent extremism. Terrorism has increased since he took power in 2013. Look, uh, just think for France, for example. Can we apply the same principle and say because of repression, they have all these terrorist acts in Paris in the last year, for example, or a couple of years? You have seen how many attacks in Belgium and Paris. Is it because of the repression as well? So I think the Washington Post here, when they so when they relate, when you say no, I'm saying yeah. you cannot say that terrorism is the outcome of repression. When the when she, the Washington Post is trying to to relate them together, I am saying you cannot relate terrorism to oppression because in in the recent history of the world, we have some uh, places like Iraq, Saddam. I'm not saying he's a good man, but with the extreme sub rep repression. And during Nasser time, with his extreme repression, we didn't see terrorist acts. So we cannot just simply say, because of the repression of al-Sisi, we have terrorist acts there. This is number one. Number two, you need uh, stability to ensure that you can have human rights in any region. See the areas where we lost the stability, Libya, Syria, Iraq. What happened? We have slave marks of ISIS. We have some abuses for human rights that are far more what we see today in Egypt. Today, Egypt is a stable country. People from Libya, from Syria, from Yemen, travel to do business in Egypt and start their life there. So Al-Sisi kept the country stable enough. Yes, we know that he inherited a lot of human rights right. abuses through the system. He needs to do more, but as a balancing power, you need the stability, fellas. Then you build, uh, you lose your stability, then well, there will be no I, human I, rights. Yeah, I take your point, although some would say that there wouldn't be ISIS in Iraq or in Syria if the United States didn't invade Iraq. That's another story completely. Perry, let me get to you. The United States and its closest ally, Arab ally in the region, Saudi Arabia, consider Iran to be an existential threat. Um, Egypt does not share that view, but to what extent does that determine the relationship with Egypt? Uh, I would say, I, I, I don't think Iran, in, in this case, is a big piece of it. I think, yeah. as, as Claire mentioned rightfully, I mean, yeah. I think it's here, the strategic interest is the, uh, the peace treaty, the Egyptian peace treaty with Israel. Right. Um, and so that's, I think, in terms of the geopolitical um, linkage, it's there rather than Iran. And in fact, if you look at uh, Egypt's policies vis-a-vis -vis Syria, uh, they're quite different than the Gulf states. And it's in right. part because it doesn't see the Iran threat in quite, quite the same way um, because of its geography. But, but if I could go back to, to, to uh, the point that, that Taufik made, I, yeah. I, I agree with him that it's hard to draw a direct line between repression and terrorism. Right. But what really worries me, and I think the big problem Egypt has, is the economic challenges and the need to create jobs and the need to, 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 to get foreign investment. And this is where I think the repression really matters because I think if you're a foreign company kind of on the sidelines considering whether or not to, to, to invest in Cairo or elsewhere, I think you look at the, at the, at the level of, of, of abuses, human rights abuses, it makes you think twice. It makes you think twice in terms of the country's long-term long -term stability. So whether or not you agree that the repression has a direct linkage yeah. uh, to, to, to terrorism and radicalization, I think to me there's no question, but the economic challenges do. And here I'm afraid that Egypt is on uh, a, a rather poor trajectory. But you, you lived with the radicals for some period in your life, you realize that there is a need for some level of repression for them to ensure stability to, that brings investment. So now the situation in Egypt, if you don't do some element of repression, especially for the radical Islamists, uh -huh. then you will have them free enough to cause terror acts which will deter any foreign investor from coming to the country. Mm. So that is the balance, again, that we need. I know it is but very... But if I agreed with that position, and I'm not sure I do, it seems to me that the repression is extending far beyond the Islamists. Yeah. It's, 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 it's student groups, it's union activists, uh, it's journalists, it's secular types. And then Egypt need to reevaluate maybe the situation to, to do it in a more um, effective way toward the radical it also, Islamists. It also extends to a political party that was in power. But let me go to Omar. Omar, what is your view on this? 
Yeah, I think I have to say something being a specialist in security studies. Uh, first, uh, just let put, let's put things in scholarly perspective. Repression radicalization is the most significant coloration that security studies have produced so far, statistically and empirically. Like looking at it in a very uh, a wide uh, scope from the uh, uh, beginning of the uh, 90, I think it was uh, Ted Robert Gurr's uh, data sets. Uh, it was very clear that uh, you know repression uh, leading to radicalization from the, the why men rebel approach is, is very very clear uh, in that dimension. So they are very significantly correlated. That's one. With the very specific case of Egypt, jihadism and takfirism, as we know them today, both the, the two ideologies that legitimate uh, violence against the other, were born in Egyptian prisons under Nasser, uh, under the torture of the uh, Nasser regime at that point in, in Egyptian prisons. And you know the 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 the, uh, the famous incident that made Sayyid Qutb tick uh, and start uh, uh, um, uh, authoring these, uh, reinterpreting Quran for the third time, the third edition of In Shadows of the uh, of the Quran, and then after that milestones, was basically a massacre in Limantora prison that happened in July 1957, uh, where about 20 political prisons were gunned down and 81 were wounded, and he mm -hmm. was witnessing uh, 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 most of that. So, you know, we, we, there are, there's a very, very clear coloration on how terrorists are produced in Egypt uh, since the 60s. Okay. Uh, so that, that, that need, needs to be uh, clarified. Uh, well, the right, problem the now is that, uh, as, as was mentioned, the, the, the repression circles is quite extending to people yeah. like uh, uh, American citizen Aya Hijazi, who is an NGO activist, That's right, dealing yeah. primarily, forming an NGO for, uh, uh, for street kids to help street children in Egypt, which, are, which is a, a very complicated social phenomenon uh, that has been expanding uh, quite significantly. Okay. If, uh, yeah, and if, now if, she's so, facing okay. a life sentence uh, in, in, in Egyptian prisons. So, right, Omar, I just want to get uh, Claire's view on this. Go if ahead. I could jump in yeah. um, w with a point of history. Yeah. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh -huh. a jihadist organization dedicated to the restoration of the caliphate and a global caliphate under rule of Sharia, Islamic law, was founded in 1928 by students led by Hassan al-Banna who were not responding to any kind of repression. They were responding to the abolition of the caliphate that had taken place four years previously in 1924 under Kemal Ataturk uh, when he abolished the last uh, Ottoman uh, Empire uh, caliphate. So it wasn't that the Brotherhood arose out of some kind of repressive circumstances. They arose to reestablish the caliphate, establish it across the entire world, right. And impose Sharia. Really, okay. the, 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 the phases of development of the brothers needs to be addressed more carefully. From 1928 to 1932, this was more, more or less a social reformist organization that wanted to yeah, establish the caliphate. But the caliphate, had, you know, of the Ottomans okay. had so uh, uh, ministers them. and prime ministers yeah. who were who were Christians and Jewish. All right, terrific, very good. Uh, Nasser repressed uh, the, them, yeah. but what happened, the President Sadat released them and they killed him at the end. Mm -hmm. So we cannot say repression. During the repression of Nasser, they couldn't do anything. In fact, the guy who released them from prison and he gave them freedom, they killed him. Also, can you explain to us why the communists in Egypt, who were also suppressed and repressed by Nasser regime, didn't use terrorism as a weapon and didn't turn so violent like the Brotherhood and the Islamists uh, really, in general? Really, the communists in Egypt, the communists and the Nasserists in Egypt were strong supporters of the assassination of Sadat. They they came and publicly But they didn't that. do terrorist okay. acts. They didn't do suicide bombing. All right, I want to get there to There was Perry. an organization I... called Revolution e Egypt that assassinated uh, Israeli diplomats and targeted American diplomats as well. It was a Nasser organization so I mean I mean the all right the, Omar I, I want to yeah, yeah, move on to something issues. else yeah. uh, and Perry uh, I want to go to you for this and that is uh, Egypt has a very unstable neighbor mm. Libya uh, and the Egyptians would like the United States to get more involved in establishing some kind of political solution there uh, fearing that the instability next door could destabilize their own country do you think that came up for discussion what can the United States do uh, I suspect it probably did. Uh, I'm not sure it was item number one, two, or, or three. Um, and, and that, I think, highlights the problem in these relationships, yeah. that each country has their own set of, of priorities. And there's, you know, with a region in chaos, these lists get to be pretty long. Um, uh, you know, I, looking back, I think the U.S. United States did make a big mistake. President Obama um, has called Libya uh, the biggest mistake of his presidency, and I think the lack of follow-through from the U.S. in the early days uh, uh, really, uh, uh, in, in, in many ways, contributed to the, to the 
chaos there. You know, what the United States can do now okay. and what the United States is willing to do now, unfortunately, it's a much harder challenge now than it would have been in 2011 okay. and 2012. Very quickly, I've got 30 I think seconds. the lines yeah. are very clearly drawn in Libya right now, and they are the same lines that actually existed previously, but now it's in a situation of post-collapse. Uh, You've got the Libyan National Army located in the, in the eastern part of Libya, right. uh, headquartered at Tobruk, and the forces there led by General Haftar. Now, Egypt and President al-Sisi are supporting General Haftar in his fight against the jihadis that Obama's overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi set loose across the country. I think it makes sense to me uh, that we should help our, pre our, our friend President al-Sisi in his uh, efforts to, to support uh, General Haftar. Yes. Okay. Now, the Russians are already in there working with General Haftar. That doesn't mean we can't or shouldn't, but it, need, it means that we need to look at this more carefully, I think, than we have. Okay, that's where we're going to have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for joining us.